All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Sigelman. I am one of the co-creators of the Open Tracing Project, and I'm a co-founder at Lightstep, where I think about this sort of problem all day and all night. I'm really excited to be here. I live in California, so I rarely get to come out to this part of the world. And uh, I was actually excited it was so crappy out yesterday because it's nothing quite like the feeling of going to a beautiful historic city and then being trapped in a conference the whole time. And then today it's really beautiful. So I'm having mixed feelings about being here and not, you know, looking at a castle or something like that. But here we are. So I'm excited to be here. I'm uh, giving a talk uh, not really about open tracing specifically, although I'll certainly cover that. And I look forward to talking with anyone here about it separate from this, but really about the ecosystem in general with tracing. Tracing is always a, a complicated process because you need to integrate across your entire stack uh, in order to see it all. And it's even more complicated in the open source world because the positioning of the various projects can be unclear and there's a lot of overlap in terminology. So in this talk, I'm hoping to demystify a lot of that for everyone here. It goes without saying, but I really encourage people to interrupt me and ask questions. I love that. It's fun to be interrupted in this context anyway. And I'll try and pause for, for that here and there, but uh, if not, we can wait till the end. So these are the sorts of things I was hoping we could address. I want to define what distributed tracing is for people, uh, hopefully without taking too much time, because I imagine if you're here, you probably already have a sense. I'd like to compare it to the rest of the universe of monitoring and observability technology, uh, talk about the moving parts, and then get down to business and figure out why there are so many different projects that talk about tracing and where the boundaries are and how they compare and contrast and why it's not an either or and it's probably a, a many for anyone in this room. All right, so first things first, how does distributed tracing fit? into the monitoring ecosystem. So I made this slide up. This is not, I think the conventional talk track is that you need logging, metrics, and tracing. I personally don't subscribe to that. I think of it as being an odd way to segment things. I think that there are fundamentally two activities and fundamentally two types of data for everything related to observing a system. There's, uh, the activities are the rows. You either are measuring a symptom of interest to you or you're explaining why it doesn't look the way it should. Those are the only two things you're doing if you're trying to observe your system. So root cause analysis and debugging is clearly in explaining. Measuring symptoms will be things like, I want my P99 latency to be less than 950 milliseconds or what have you. But there are symptoms that are important to you, usually for business reasons. And then of course the explanation can involve many different tools and technologies. Now, uh, in the columns, there are really only two types of data. There are events, which are usually structured, and I mean that in the most general sense. So an, a log line that has a timestamp and a message is a type of event. And then there are statistics, usually arranged in a time series. These are the squiggly lines that we look at in our dashboards. There are lots of different kinds of squiggly lines and lots of different kinds of statistics, but they're fundamentally a category in that they're aggregations, usually of events, actually, but not always. And, uh, and then you can look at this and almost anything that you care about from a monitoring standpoint fits into one of these quadrants. Uh, distributed tracing almost always is on the bottom right although we're starting to see products that use distributed tracing data to generate time series data. So it's starting to bleed over a little bit to the left. And they're also almost always used to explain symptoms and do root cause analysis. The reason why it's so important is that transactions, even ordinary transactions, are now distributed. So if you want to take a single event from your system and explain it, you need to follow it across your system, which I'll talk about in a second. Questions? All right, so this is a diagram that I like to use in these talks. On the top is, a, is an illustration of what a transaction might look like in a monolith. The, uh, oh, this has a little laser pointer, look at that. Wow, amazing. This isn't even digital. So this, um, this transaction goes across package boundaries in your monolith. Uh, 
And then roughly speaking, when you move to microservices, your packages become microservices, but your transaction still goes through them. So in order to understand the basic story of an individual transaction, you need some new technology. You can't just look at your logs or whatever you did in the monolith. And so distributed tracing is about uh, taking requests and telling a clear story about them as they go through a system. And it's really nothing more than gluing events together that's all it is. It's very simple at a conceptual level, but there are a lot of complexities to making that work. You need to glue them not just in time, but also structurally. You need to know what caused what, because microservices involve huge amounts of concurrency and parallelism, which I'll get to in the next slide here. Uh, oh yeah, this is a, uh, on the left is a kind of system diagram where a client calls a server, does authentication and billing, and then hits a database. This is one way of thinking about a transaction structurally, and this is the kind of thing that we typically draw on our whiteboards, right? And then over here is a timing diagram showing the same transaction with uh, a shared time axis. Most distributed tracing systems have a visualization that looks more like this. Um, without naming names, this isn't a value judgment or anything like that, but APM systems that are pre-distributed systems, things that deal with monoliths, typically represent transactions like this. Because if you don't have a lot of concurrency, you can, you can say a lot here. However, if you're dealing with tons of concurrency, you really need to have a shared time access in order to understand the transactions. So I think this transition from a conceptual standpoint to seeing things as some shared waterfall is indicative of the complexity. Uh, at Lightstep, we see a lot of production traces that have you know, many thousands of these timed events in them just for single user-facing transactions that get back to the end user within a couple of hundred milliseconds. So you do need to have uh, a, a mental model that can scale with that sort of complexity. Uh, this is the basic mental and data model that we use in open tracing. I'm not suggesting this is the only way to look at it. There's a great academic paper called Xtrace that came out in the early 2000s and another great academic paper called Pivot Tracing that was uh, published in 2015 and one best paper at SOSP that has a totally different set of names. The concepts are very similar. It's all event data in some fashion. Uh, in the open tracing model, which borrows from the dapper terminology, uh, which I worked on at Google in the early 2000s, uh, it refers to, well, I'll go back to this slide, it refers to each, each one of these things is a span. Uh, a span is something that has a start time and an end time and a parent, and you can use the parent references to construct a tree of causality. So what you have here are uh, a series of spans, one causing the other, and each span can have tags on it that are key values, as well as logs, which uh, potentially is a misnomer. I think in the Zipkin world, they're called annotations. Uh, but the idea is that it's just a timestamp with a bunch of structured data that's attached to a span. So an example of a log in a trace might be something like, uh, I'm going to have a span for this RPC call, and I'm going to log when the bytes actually hit the wire, and I'm going to log when they're received on the other side, and things like that. So little moments in the lifetime of a span are called logs in the open tracing world. And then there are a number of identifiers that are attached to these things as well to figure out which is the parent, which is the child, what the unique ID is for the transaction in general, these sorts of things. Um, I, the slides are going to be uh, attached to the sketch.com or whatever it is site for this talk. So if this doesn't make sense, or if you don't feel like you can read all this, don't sweat it. The, the only important thing to understand for the purposes of this talk is that traces are structured, they're made out of these little spans that have a start and an end time, and there's a lot of structured data attached to them. The rest of it is the level of detail you don't need for this talk. Good? Okay. See, people don't seem confused. This is great. All right, so now we get to the meat of the talk. So let's talk about tracing, 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 and tracing. There are four words that are used to describe different things. Uh, unfortunately, it's the same word, uh, which is causing a lot of confusion, as you might imagine. So, okay, so what is tracing? Tracing is about analyzing transactions. These are six screenshots from six tracing solutions. Some are open source, some are not. I was a, a good boy and I didn't include my company's product in this uh, as much as I was tempted to, but uh, 
it's about analyzing transactions. If you talk about doing tracing, what you're saying is that I'm going to go as an operator and look at a tool like one of these and deduce something about my system. So that's what tracing is. It's about analyzing transactions. And, and when I'm saying this, I'm usually in the mode of an operator who's trying to get to the bottom of some kind of latency or production issue. Uh, no, actually, that's wrong. So tracing is about recording transactions. So what we're doing here is we have some kind of uh, service. It's a microservice, or maybe it's a sidecar like Envoy or Linkerd or something like that. There's some kind of runtime that's sitting in there that's taking data, recording it, tracing it, and sending it out of the process to a backend system. So this is what tracing is. You're, uh, and you're thinking from the perspective of someone who needs to get this data into a central place. Either it's your own company's ELK stack, you need to get it into, your, um, in, into some kind of database, or maybe you're a tracing vendor or someone developing an open source tracing system. And so tracing is the act of recording transactions. So that's a valid interpretation as well. Unfortunately, it's completely different than the first one, but it's valid. Uh, another way to think of it is that tracing is about federating transactions. So now we have everyone, you know, moving to the cloud. You'll use whatever, uh, Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Spanner or something like that. These are not open source projects. There's absolutely no chance that Amazon is going to open source S3. And I would say the same thing about Spanner. So you trace into these things in the sense that you call them, you depend on them. Uh, maybe Kinesis is an even better example because it's not just a leaf in your stack. It's actually in the middle of your stack and data is going in and out of it over and over again. You need to see into it. You need to trace it. Um, but unfortunately, they're not going to open source that code. So what are you going to do? So there's this um, movement in the tracing world right now to federate transactions. And some people, when they think about tracing, what they're talking about doing is getting from you know, the code that you run and deploy yourself into cloud services and then into something like X-Ray and then have all this data flow into the same place. So when you're using your uh, open source tracing tool or your APM solution, you can see the transactions that go through your business logic in and out of cloud services and then back to the same place again. So federation is an activity that matters deeply to people who are concerned with observability in their systems and also matters to cloud providers. So there's a lot of talk among the Microsofts and the Googles and the Amazons right now of trying to find protocols and ways for this picture to actually work. Uh, right now, I would argue it does not unfortunately work, but it's something that could be made to work with some effort. So this is a major area of investment right now from a standards standpoint. And then finally, uh, last but not least, tracing is the act of describing a transaction. And so what I mean there is that you, uh, as someone who owns an application, you own huge amounts of code, and much of it is code you didn't write. It's code you brought in from GitHub or that you depend on or that came in from NPM or GoDeps or something like that. And you deploy this code, and you need to understand how it works. So. Uh, some might say that tracing this code is a matter of instrumenting it. Um, I would argue that from the standpoint of a developer, uh, someone who's writing code, this is the part of tracing that is presently the most painful, uh, but it's not the same as the other three tracings. It's not the same thing as, uh, as uh, federating the transactions. It's not the same thing as recording them. And it's not the same thing as observing them um, or understanding them in, an, in a tool. So these are the four tracings. I hope it made sense. I haven't shown this deck before, uh, so I have no idea if people think it makes sense or not. I don't see people sleeping. I see one thumbs up. This suggests some sort of compliance with the ideas I'm putting on the screen. This is great. Yeah, so these are the four things. Now, this is a matter where I'm going to provide a personal opinion. I'm allowed to do that uh, as long as I say so. I think that these all have their place. I feel very strongly they should be decoupled. Uh, one of the biggest problems right now in the tracing ecosystem is that there's unclear positioning as to what problems people are solving. Uh, I would argue that people are getting a little bent out of shape, actually, sometimes about the, about the scope of these different projects, mostly because there's confusion about what problem we're solving. If you have a bunch of really smart people and, uh, and they're working on a problem, 
if they hear someone else use the same word, tracing, to describe a different problem, they kind of get upset because the solution's just, it's like an impotence mismatch. And there's a lot of confusion right now. And I feel very strongly the tracing world should be clear about the positioning of these projects and make sure the projects solve one of these things, ideally. Or if they don't, if they solve three, at least make it really clear that you can depend on the three separately. When open source projects have a scope creep, it always leads to bad things. Um, I think it, it creates a lot of uh, uh, competing interests and you can't get one without the other and so on and so forth. So a big part of my talk here is to hopefully indoctrinate that idea in some of you out there in the audience. So let's look at some tracing projects and how they fit together. How am I doing for time? Not too bad. So, all right. Um, oh, whoops, I, I messed up my animation. That's all right. Well, here's an example of a transaction. It comes into a uh, service and then goes into uh, a microservice and then goes into a cloud provider. Um, there's a small amount of context data that's sent in over the wire. And then there are um, tracing systems that will take data and get it into the tracing tool. Uh, this, this data right here is much larger than this data here that's sent in over the HTTP request. This is usually in headers. This is something that's buffered and ends up being you know, megabytes of data, not you know, single bytes of data like here. Uh, the cloud service generates data as well that might go into something like X-Ray, and then you want it all to be in the same place. People who write tracing systems um, that's like you know me or the people working on uh, Jaeger or Zipkin or whatever. We care deeply about these things. Um, I'll get to that later. Uh, the people who actually use the tools, the operators, the only thing they really care about is that the tool works. Um, so they care deeply about this. This is where the person analyzing the transaction sits. Uh, they're the people who care about recording the data. This incorporates uh, the vendors who create tracing tools as well as uh, people who want to kind of get in and hack their system to send data to a logging platform as well. And then there's a fourth class of users who instrument the systems. Um, these are usually developers either uh, who work at some company and need to get visibility into their services uh, or who, uh, in their spare time or as part of their job, work on open source software. There's some nice examples of tracing getting built directly into things like Couchbase and Cockroach and things like that right now. That work um, is done by instrumenters. So I've, I talked before about there being four basic use cases or four basic problems that tracing uh, concerns itself with. Those are reflected by these four different colors, people instrumenting stuff, people recording stuff, um, people who write tracing systems, and then finally people who actually use them and derive uh, operational efficiencies through them. So now we can talk about how different um, projects map on this. Here's Zipkin. I started with this one because it's, um, it's like the OG, the original gangster tracing system, uh, and uh, has a little bit of everything because it's, it, it was, when it started, there was nothing. Um, Zipkin is an implementation of Dapper that was started at Twitter and is now um, incubated out of Pivotal and uh, is run by Adrian Cole. And it has um, really a, a great community built around it and a lot of momentum as a result. Uh, they have uh, a little bit of everything for everyone. This, uh, when something is gray, it means that not just that the system does it, but that there is actually a separate stable interface. Like for instance, in Zipkin, there's a, a, the Java SDK is called Brave, and it's a separate project in GitHub that you can use to instrument uh, JD, JVM software uh, to work with Zipkin. Um, they have this thing called B3, which is their own context propagation uh, format, although they're part of a later slide to standardize that more. They have a uh, de facto standard of way of describing data that is accepted by other cloud providers, like Google Stackdriver Trace accepts Zipkin formatted data, Jaeger accepts Zipkin formatted data. So they have a de facto standard here. And then of course they have the, the actual tool itself that people run and use to, to understand their systems. So they cover a lot of these bases. Um, Jaeger, uh, which is um, a younger project, but a similar type of value proposition to Zipkin, is actually a little bit tighter in that it, it uses open tracing natively to handle this. So its scope is concerned, uh, it, it is uh, the context, it has its own recording system, it has its own data format, and it has its own tool. Um, uh, I think um, 
it's an interesting comparison to look at Jaeger and Zipkin. Uh, they, they have, a, again, they have similar feature sets, similar value propositions, and I'm not here to say one is better than the other by any means. You should look at them both. It is interesting that um, Jaeger doesn't need to concern itself with instrumentation because it's deliberately decoupled that piece of the puzzle out. Um, open tracing also has some compatibility with Zipkin, um, so you, you can do that too. But, but Jaeger is like a more tightly scoped project, and I, I think it actually allows them to move a little bit more quickly in terms of development velocity as a result. Um, there's um, uh, also a, uh, a project called Skywalking, Sky Wusheng, uh, who lives in China, uh, built this thing. It's actually moving very quickly. There's some other things that have similar profile to, to Jaeger that I didn't include on this slide. Um, now let's talk about X-Ray. I think this is funny because this talk is supposed to be an open source tracing ecosystem talk. Um, Amazon X-Ray is not open source. It's very closed source. But the, the reason that I'm bringing it up here is that um, I mentioned it earlier, but if your open source software depends on S3 or Kinesis, you can't see it unless you can get into the cloud providers. And so there is a need for Amazon to cooperate in that regard, and, and they do actually. Abhishek, who runs that project, is very collaborative in this type of space. But they have a role to play, and there are standards that need to be created to get the data from X-Ray, which is this box basically, into whatever tracing or APM tool you want to use. I think I was chatting with someone from Instana earlier, and I know that they've done some work to get the X-Ray data into their product, for instance, and, and other vendors do similar things. Um, but uh, um, X-Ray uh, also has its own separate way of instrumenting software. Uh, to be honest, I wish they didn't. <laughs> I think it, it, this is the sort of fragmentation that I don't think is particularly helpful, but they do. Um, and they also have, uh, Amazon has their own context format up here that, that they've announced and have guarantees around the stability. So you see a project like X-Ray and it actually encompasses three, maybe four, depending on how you count, different areas of standardization for tracing. And I think having a mental model like this can help you when you're analyzing these things for your own your own solutions within your organizations, help you analyze you know, which parts of this you should really be taking um, for which. Uh, moving into W3C, so W3C, I'm just checking my time here, still doing pretty well. Uh, W3C, of course, is the World Wide Web Consortium. They generally do uh, standards around things like web browsers. They also have a really interesting project right now. Uh, this guy, Alois, who works as a CTO at Dynatrace, has kicked off an, an effort involving many different constituencies. I have a dedicated slide about this later as well. Um, just to focus on this and nothing else. I love this. This makes me very warm in my heart. It's like a narrow scope, a clear value proposition. If everyone can agree about how to do this, then fine, we can like, interchange data, we can have traces go from vendor to vendor, and everyone wins. And keeping that thing scoped to just this little box is like a massive win for that project, and I would argue for everyone who depends on it, as you know you're not going to pull in a bunch of other garbage, basically. Um, and there's been plenty of pressure to broaden the scope of that discussion, and they've been very disciplined about keeping it tight and focused. And I think you can see the momentum coming out of that as a result. Um, this uh, benefits mainly people who author tracing systems, frankly, um, but it will benefit everyone in this room in that once people can actually agree about this stuff, uh, progress will move much more rapidly towards actual interoperability between these systems. And so uh, it's, this, is, this does have general benefits as well. Uh, the last thing I'll say about this is, is that um, it's pretty funny. I mean, if you look at the initial proposals for this, let's see, I, the first time I saw an actual proposal was over a year ago. It was March of 2017. It's the kind of thing where if I went and took anyone here for half an hour and described the data model and said, you know, come up with a format. Let's just propose something. If you have a technical background, you'd probably propose something that's very similar to what this is. And it's been, you know, 
bike shedded and argued into oblivion. I mean, they've spent like 25 people have spent over a year getting this thing totally perfect. And it turns out like actually getting it perfect, getting that last 10% is really, really difficult. You need to maintain Ford's compatibility. You need to make sure that all the vendors who depend on this will actually have their needs met. You need to have compatibility tests and reference implementations and all this W3C stuff. And they're doing all that work. It's actually, it would be pretty thankless except that I'm s sitting here saying thank you to them for doing this, but it's awesome work that they're doing this stuff um, and everyone benefits from it. So the technical stuff looks pretty basic when you take a look at it, but it's actually quite impactful. Uh, they also have a project that's starting, uh, that's um, talking about standardizing this piece. Uh, um, this is the missing link to make uh, interoperability of systems like X-Ray and, you know, your favorite tracing tool really work in a standards compliant way. Also very important and um, overlaps a bit with some of the instrumentation pieces. This is where you would say things like, if you're going to make an HTTP call, these are the five tags you must have. You must have path, you must have the method, that sort of stuff. Defining precisely what they are, precisely how they're spelled, precisely what the semantics of all the strings are, that kind of stuff is what this effort is all about. And there's a group of about 25 or so people who are interested in working on this. If you care about it, let me know and I can put you in touch with them. But, but they're trying to get all this stuff sorted out so that when you export data from even things that are like hardware routers and stuff like that in the future, will emit data in formats that can be consumed by any system. And that is also quite valuable and is also a very narrow scope. So I, I'm excited about it. Um, Open Census is a project that was announced by Google in the last three or four months. It's uh, it basically handles everything that sits inside your process that's part of a tracing system. So it handles instrumentation. It also handles the collection of data within the process, getting it into some kind of format, potentially that format I just described, and then exporting it into uh, whatever tool you're using. Open Census um, uh, has uh, some internal decoupling between the instrumentation and the recording. Um, I, my understanding is they're going to be making the decoupling stronger, which is to say you can depend on this without bringing in this. I think that's actually crucially important for that project, and I really hope that that happens as soon as possible. Um, but Open Census is probably a best of breed open source runtime for just getting the data out of the process in a way that doesn't introduce overhead or inefficiency. It's, it's based on the, the work they did inside Google on the same stuff and it's very high throughput. And then finally, open tracing uh, also has a very narrow scope. It's really designed with these people in mind. Uh, the idea is if you're going to adopt tracing within your organization, you're going to hit a brick wall, which is that you probably depend on dozens of open source projects and you need to instrument them and you don't want to do that work yourself. The value of open tracing is that it brings that instrumentation in from an open source community that wrote it for you, so you don't need to do that work, and it doesn't do anything else. It's the only thing it does. It then allows you to make all the other decisions about your tracing system independently. Again, I think of that as a feature of the project, and I like that narrowness, um, and it interoperates with you know, virtually everything that we've seen so far. Uh, there's also some overlap with this effort to standardize the fields that go into things like HTTP calls, database calls, et cetera, because uh, that's part of instrumentation. So there needs to be some coordination there. So that's a summary of like the major ecosystem efforts. There are certainly other things out there that I didn't cover, um, but I got through most of it. Um, I'll spend my last couple of minutes um, just making a quick pitch again for having narrow scope for these sorts of things. Um, this is uh, what we hit with open tracing when I was talking with people implementing tracing at a number of pretty large organizations that are well on their way in the cloud native journey microservices and so on and so forth. And we were spending our, our time together talking about really sexy, attractive UIs for tracing data. And then when we'd go and have lunch and have drinks, everyone was just complaining about the fact that we couldn't get instrumentation deployed. And that was preventing any of the cool uh, features from delivering value. And so a bunch of us ba banded together and created open tracing in an effort to basically band, you know, band together and solve that particular instrumentation problem once and for all so no one else has to do it. And uh, I would argue that if you're a developer, 
um, as opposed to an operator, the main pain point for tracing is instrumentation. There is a little bit of stuff around SDKs and backends, but the instrumentation is just like a massive, massive headache, um, unless you have something that factors that out. So um, open tracing is designed to address that pain, that specific pain point. It, I think there are nine sort of standard languages, and there's a couple more that are uh, languages I don't even really know. Uh, there's some like Haskell stuff going on and things like that. Um, there's over 100 packages that support open tracing now and many more being added kind of month over month. Uh, and there's also a diversity of places you can send this data. There are a number of commercial vendors uh, like me, <laughs> but also a bunch of great open source projects, uh, Jaeger and Zipkin being the most popular of those, as well as Skywalking that I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, by sitting there between these constituents and that's it, open tracing solves this important pain point and allows you to choose best of breed solutions for everything else. And I think that narrowness is a great benefit to open tracing and a great benefit to the community as opposed to increasing the scope and saying, well, now we're going to make an open tracing UI. It's tempting. We actually have literally reduced the scope of open tracing over time. We've like removed stuff from it to make it as small as possible. And I think especially in open source sort of standards work with a lowercase s, like things where you're trying to get many constituents to agree, the narrowest scope is the best scope. I'll also, again, give a plug for the W3C work, uh, very similar conceptually. They have over 25 people participating in this discussion trying to sort out exactly how the standard is going to work that will affect everything from hardware to, you know, the coolest, newest service mesh stuff that's going on. And they have everyone in there solving this one very narrow problem. It helps keep the discussion super focused and encourages this best of breed approach. Uh, and... So, I mean, I'm really enthusiastic about this kind of stuff. So, in terms of the overall message for this talk, I mean, tracing is table stakes. I don't even need to say that anymore. That's why people show up to these things. You need to do it if you're doing microservices or you will be in a world of pain. So, that's a fact. Uh, um, unfortunately, it involves many constituents. And I think that the ecosystem around tracing is starting to get really complex. There are many projects that have overlapping scope and overlapping focus. So I hope that this talk provides a mental model for people to think about which problem you're really trying to solve with which piece, and that you can choose the solution that works the best for each piece. If you have any questions about this, um, I really want to emphasize this. I come to Europe basically never. Last time I was here was like 2010. Uh, that's not true but it's almost true. The last time I was here was like for 36 hours. I would love to talk to people. I, I never get out here. I'm, I'm here for three days. Come and talk to me, even if it's not about this. I'd love to meet you um, and get your feedback about your own experiences, getting tracing into your particular organizations. Um, and uh, it can be about open tracing, it can be about anything in the stack. Um, but I'd love to talk to you and uh, I hope this is useful. And with that, uh, are there any questions? Uh, yes? Yes. So the question was, what's the difference between recording? Oh, by the way, do I have to stop right at uh, in two minutes, or can I go a few minutes over? Yeah. I have to stop. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay. So recording. The difference between recording and logging. I think like logging as a word is so it's almost worse than tracing in terms of being overloaded. It's really no different if you mean logging in terms of getting the data into some sort of event stream. Um, I think that the type of data people usually log is much coarser grained. Like if you're using Elk or something like that, the amount of data you'll put into an Elk stack is probably a lot smaller than the total amount of data the recorder would see. Recording often involves things like sampling strategies and, and things like that, which reduce the volume of tracing data in order to make it more tractable from a cost standpoint. Yeah. So the question is, if you're moving from a monolith like a Rails app into a microservices world that has a bunch of Golang services, how do you do that from an adoption standpoint? It's a really, really good question, and not, not a, that's a great talk. Like, how do you actually deploy tracing during a monolith to microservices transition? Um, I don't have time for the full answer, but the short version is that you start where your business cares about it. Don't try to do it all at once. If there's one thing you learn from this talk, an entire talk, it's this answer. Don't do tracing all at once. 
please, for your own sake, just do the part that your business really depends on. Start at the core. So in your monolith, just do the core pieces, and then when you add new microservices, make sure it's built in from scratch. That's pretty sane, not too bad. We've seen customers that will deploy tracing across like 5 or 10% of their system and see tremendous value, because they chose the 5 or 10% that actually matters to their business. But that's the essence of it. Um, I think I have time for one more question. Ah. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, if you depend on a microservice you didn't write and it doesn't use the same tracing scheme that you do, what do you do? Now, that's a good question. It depends on what the service is. If there's really no way to contribute to upstream, it's really tough, frankly. I, I, don't, I think this is the vision of open tracing for what it's worth, is that those sorts of things are built in. Like Couchbase recently built open tracing into Couchbase. I don't mean into like the wire protocol, but into Couchbase itself. So if you use open tracing, you can see right through into the, into the meat of the database and back up. That's the model I'd like to see. Um, but it does require standardized methods of describing transactions. And that's the only path, unfortunately. And if, if you're using a microservice that you didn't write and it doesn't support tracing, that is a black box and is a huge bummer. Um, and we just need more standards. All right, I'm done. Thank you, everyone. Please come up and talk to me if you want.